Thank you very much for coming. Um, a little bit about myself. I am Anna. I'm a Java champion and certified architect, currently working as a developer advocate for Red Hat. You can find me on Twitter at Ambra1508. And I enjoy to look into more complex scenarios that are involving creating Java-based applications, working with multiple cloud providers, working with Kubernetes. So these are pretty much my passions. And I kind of go beyond the Hello World stuff so that I can see how, how I can help developers to deal with the real life problems that they have. And in the talk of today, maybe some concepts will be a little harder to grasp, but I'm looking forward to your questions. And yes, don't be afraid to ask questions. Let's dive into the content. First of all, why do we need distributed tracing? So where does this need come from uh, to look into distributed tracing? Well, if we're looking to how our architectures have evolved, some time ago, but even nowadays, uh, we call that we're building uh, some systems with the vintage approach, meaning we're building a monolithical system that typically persists data into a single database. And tracing what happened with our transactions in the case of a monolith, it came much more easier for us as developers because, well, we used to deal with just one persistent store. But with the modern approach, when going with ahead with distributed systems, we are splitting the concerns of our um, applications into multiple mini applications, each of them maybe with their own persistence store. And when it comes to looking into transactions, we are actually wanting to know where did our transaction has traveled, like from the end user has initiated something, a request, and how did that get fulfilled? And of course, um, how did that travel across the many persistence stores that back up our microservices, right? So, um, Pretty much this is why we are looking today into distributed tracing. But furthermore, the story of distributed tracing and why we need it and why it's so important for us is starting the, with the fact that once upon a time, something unexpected occurred. And as you can see in the image here, um, well, it's yellowish. So it, maybe it's a warning. It's not something that we should be worried about. But what happens is that, well, in this case, some logs were generated, some metrics were recorded about the unexpected situation, but nothing else tells us that something wrong has happened with our app. Because when things happen one time, um, we tend to ignore them. Maybe it was just one time thing, it will never happen again, so maybe we, we don't need to look into it. And probably they're not alarms to trigger the one time stuff. But if it happens next times, then you get some logs, you get some metrics, and thanks to those metrics, maybe those can help you to see the impact on your service level objectives. Now, let me pause here because the acronym might be known, not known by everybody. Uh, please raise your hand if you know what the SLOs are. Okay, we have like half an audience that knows what SLOs are. So just a quick background. <laughs> service level agreements um, mean the promises that we're making to the customers, we the developers. Uh, SLO several level objectives mean the goal that the team is like proposing to achieve those promises. And service level uh, indicators are actually how we're like saying, how did we do it? How did we achieve it? We respond with those to how did we meet the goals for those promises. So getting back to the presentation, the metrics can impact the service level objectives. Um, but what happens and what is like really important for us is that when this issue is like impacting many our SLOs, so and this like digresses our service level agreements and impacts our understanding and promises that our applications will behave well. So this is where again distributed tracing can help us to understand on how to avoid that moment when the impact will be too damaging for our SLOs and thus to, for our SLAs. And since we talk about distributed tracing and distributed tracing to the rescue, what this does, it helps us to answer some questions, uh, to offer answers to questions like, which service calls were involved in those abnormal transactions? Uh, what were the versions of the services uh, traversed by those requests? And of course, if there were any exceptions recorded. So pretty much these questions are like, fundamentally to be asked when you're like looking to your system and you want to trace what happened to, to it. Um, 
of course, there are many more, but I summarized a few. And if we're looking at how tracing has evolved, um, everything, I would say, it started in 2007 with Xtrace. Um, then in 2012, Zipkin was open sourced by Twitter. And we got the first standards, an open tracing in 2015, and then we got to 2007, 2016 with Open Census. And tools started to like align to one of those, of those uh, specifications, either to open tracing or to open census. Um, Jaeger came into place to help us with tracing as well. And Jaeger uh, in the beginning was more aligned to the open tracing specification. But what people realized is that they would like to use tools that are, are maybe aligning to both of the specifications. And um, it would be good to have an, let's say, way to move between them. And this is why open telemetry is here to like bridge all those specifications about tracing so that we don't um, worry anymore about how we trace our application between different specifications or different tools that align to those standards. Furthermore, the uh, distributed tracing is offering us in-context tracking of a transaction from one endpoint to another one. So what this means is that everything starts with the trace ID when the request is being initiated by our, um, by, our, by our users. So there's a request coming from our users, maybe in an interface or somewhere. Then it gets context and gets to the context of like, the case of the green microservice. Then the request, of course, it gets enhanced. It gets more data when it traverses probably some other microservices, gets information from the blue one or from the yellow. And this a way of traveling of our of our request gives us of an impression of how well or um, how it performed when going through so many microservices. Now a trace um, is composed by um, many activities called spans, um, and um, these spans can have attributes. And of course, uh, whenever there are issues, uh, it would be good to record them. Um, by record the exceptions and what's not going so well um, with, our, uh, with our services. How about open telemetry? Because that was like the uh, point, the important point in the, for us with tracing, um, and because it like bridged open, um, open census and open tracing uh, specifications. So what happened with open telemetry is that this specification offered SDK implementations for different languages, Java included, there's also one for Go and for some others as well. It offers an API for developers, and the telemetry data is collected via the Open Telemetry uh, Line Protocol, the OTLP. You probably see OTLP in a lot of the configurations. This is what is coming from, from Open Telemetry Line Protocol. And what, most importantly, this specification is vendor agnostic. So these semantics here don't look at the vendor, don't, don't tell you like to use a specific tool in order to work with open telemetry. They're bridging uh, each and every tool that's available there in the market for tracing um, to, uh, to this uh, type of uh, specification. So it's not like forcing you to choose something and, and stay with that. But most importantly, with open telemetry is the collector because the collector acts as a proxy between our tools. And the collector proxies the receivers, which are tools that can, um, uh, can have data pushed and pulled, um, processors uh, that define on how to handle the data received, and of course exporters to which the received data is sent to. Again, tools um, in our case. But processors are the ones that are also very important in terms of like saying how to handle the data between the receivers and the exporters. Now, let me offer you a small guide to navigate within the Traces Galaxy. First of all, uh, keep the open telemetry provider configuration separate from the instrumentation calls. What this means is that most probably you're going to have the provider configuration done um, at the level of the infrastructure, meaning you're going to put some tools in place. Um, and of course, you're going to configure the collector to act, as I said, as a proxy between your receivers and exporters. But the instrumentation calls should not care that much about which um, um, tools are you using. So you should try to stay agnostic, and that's what OpenTelemetry does really well. Like, it doesn't tell you, like, hey, use only this in order to like 
customize a span uh, with some more data. You should use auto instrumentation by default. So don't try to like um, make your own instrumentation over spans over engineer unless you see that there is some performance um, improvement done there to observe how things went. By default, the auto instrumentation is working great, but of course there are some cases when you need some more input or more information because you maybe have some complex business, um, business processing done there, and it would be great to have a more in-depth view of what you've done. And last but not least, you should optimize the tracing strategy of open telemetry by using one of the SPANS processors. And I'm going to share two approaches um, with you today. So the first one is simple SPAN processor. This processing strategy is like processing the SPAN immediately after um, the request um, has successfully ended and the, the SPAN has traveled to all, the, to all the microservices in context. Or the batch SPAN processor that, like the name it says, it processes in batch the SPANs. And on this one, you can like customize the max Q size, the Q size, the delay, and of course the maximum uh, spans per, per batch that you can have and in processing. Those being said, with the guide, how much tracing data is enough? Because when dealing with distributed tracing, you might be tempted to collect all. That's the first impression and the first thing that you want to have, like collect all the data, collect all the traces to know what happened with your system, right? However, you have to think also about storing that data. Uh, collecting all might not be relevant um, on the long term, and you end up like needing a lot of storage just to have the archive of things. So when things are going great, it's good to know that they're going great, but maybe you should not trace all the situations when things went great. We want to trace only the situations that are not okay, right? So for this case, we just want to trace only what it makes, uh, makes our life easier in terms of debugging, right? And for today, I'm going to demo something for you. And this is the context of our demo. Uh, maybe it should have been bigger, but uh, I'll share the presentation with you. So there are going to be two microservices that are managing hobbies. And of course, we're going to have a simple interface where I'll need your help uh, to do some requests. So the hobby. Um, the first one, it's where the request is being sent for um, getting a hobby information. Uh, then that one is like passing some and calling some data from the activity microservice. And activity microservice get, you know, aggregates some data, does some business calling from an, to an external API, and then added some more information over it and then sends it to the other one. Now these, uh, this demo, is just for us to see how, this, how, the, how the spans are being added to our context and to trace what's going on with our application. So as you can see in the other part, both hobby and activity will generate spans. We're gonna add some attributes and recorded exceptions over it. Um, and we're gonna know where our, you know, um, our request has traveled, or, sorry, our transaction has been. Um, there are some um, extensions that influence tracing. So with these two microservices, by the way, are Quarkus-based. And because they're Quarkus-based, they have some extensions that can help me with tracing. Uh, the first one uh, is the Quarkus Open Telemetry Exporter Jaeger, because I'm exporting um, my spans to, to Jaeger. Then um, I have the Open Telemetry extension for tracing the propag to trace propagators, to trace how my data will be propagated also to Prometheus. Um, and because I am like using the um, open telemetry collector to act as a proxy uh, for both Jaeger and Prometheus, of course I need the, the uh, registry for Prometheus, the extension to work with Prometheus. And I added the Quarkus Mori Health because there's another thing you should know about distributed tracing. If possible, you should also export metrics regarding how your health uh, probe endpoints behave. Um, because you can have like informations over time of how, how many times your application has restarted, for example, um, or how many times you know, some um, HTTP responses were sent and well, maybe that showed that your application is not very, very okay or very healthy. You've got the traces with Jaeger. Jaeger is configured as receiver and exporting the open telemetry collector configuration. Receiver means that it receives the spans um, but it's configured as exporter because it will export those span metrics also to Prometheus. 
So to make a connection between tracing and metrics. So that's why uh, this uh, configuration here. And of course, the countdown of things happens in Prometheus that acts only as exporter in the collector configuration. And those being said, I need your help to scan this and for you to send some requests to my uh, app. I'm gonna give you like a minute to send some requests. Hope it's not going to be, hope it's gonna be resilient because I haven't tested the resilience of the situation. Uh, don't mind the buttons. Is I was in a hurry on making an interface to send a request. <laughs> okay, let me also go to my browser. Uh huh. With the phone. Request. Oh, good. Good. So, yay! I got a lot of requests. Good, thank you very much. Now you can stop. I think 255 requests are kind of enough. Um, so, let's see what happened. I have my, uh, by the way, I will disclose all my configurations and you can try those on your own. So it's everything for you to try, including the configuration for Jaeger and everything else. So it's not, uh, it's not something that uh, you cannot reproduce. But I hope that the internet didn't fail me. Okay, let me. This one looks healthy. He logs. Come on. Ah. Now that's a very interesting moment. I did not expect to happen. Just give me a moment to move on my other connection from data. Data, other networks. Sorry about this. It seems that I should have relied maybe on my hotspot. I'm a Zyphon. Okay. Please connect. Okay. So hoping that my iPhone. Okay. So this one worked. Uh, let's see the traces for hobby and find all. Should be some data here. I'm wondering why it's so slow. Uh, for a moment, please. Uh, why are you this slow? Let's see Prometheus. Is this? So everything should be, oh, it connected again to GBC and comm speakers. Sorry about this. Uh, keep on network. Network error when training fed resource. Okay. Cool. Thank God. Um, Okay, so we got some traces. Uh, let's figure this out because send requests and like filter by the send requests. And we can see here that sometimes the requests that you sent are okay, sometimes they're not. There are some errors. Let's pick one and see what happened. So we sent some, you sent some requests. There are some data here. There are some tags over this. There are some errors. Of course, the, the collector said that there's an error in this. The status code is 504, not very friendly. And if I'm looking at my traces, I can see that the problem was like probably ignited from the second microservice, because that's when the red uh, button is appearing. Like, in, there's a problem first time with the activity. Okay, so it looks like uh, something was not available, not good, really, really bad. How can we look into this even better and see the, and assess the impact over it? So we can start by looking at the front end with Prometheus. And by the way, everything being documented in my uh, readme, I'm just going to copy paste the um, 
query from here, the PromQL query. So if I'm going to like check my requests, my post requests, and evolution over time, if I'm looking for the API send request for the 504s, I see that there is a, quite a pipe in, the, in my request that failed. Uh, but since the problem ignited with activity, probably I should go with activity and change it here to get and see what happened in the last five minutes and execute this. Um, and if I'm looking to my activity, okay, 200 on the one, but there are some server errors on the activity type. So there are some issues um, on, on this one, like 504s for slash activity and everything went really, really bad. So this is how the things are being connected between like the problems that occurred in the traces. You can see them also together with the Prometheus, uh, with the metrics that also recorded the, the issues there. So you see the 504 in both places and you can connect, correlate what happened. Um, okay, correlate what happened. How do we fix this? How do we troubleshoot things? There is a catch. If you're looking to the UI here, all these 739 requests, uh, they're coming from a client, and sometimes when issues occur with, with applications, you don't want to troubleshoot something, especially in production, like to like, continue to uh, ping something that is faulty and maybe um, generate even more faulty data. So like, way to troubleshoot silently things, um, it works like maybe add your own custom HTTP header for debugging. So what I did for my application as a solution for this silent debugging was to add my own custom header for debugging and only to you know, execute calls to what is failing whenever um, is um, to the faulty microservice. So in my case, it's activity. So in order to do that and to expand a little bit the code part, um, let me go to the Java side. So going here, the invoked method is actually this one, the get random hobby. So get random hobby does some logic over here, and you see that if the price is less than zero one, then invokes a timeout and something very hard coded here, and then it like makes a regular call. Um, this is just for simulating the 504 situation. But in order to trace, you know, only the faulty situation, what I did, and like to like debug it pretty much easier was to add my custom trace header as a property in, 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 uh, from Quarkus. I called it trace minus debug ID. And I can use that and filter those debug, debugging messages when I'm like, trying to solve my, my tracing problems without impacting the overall metrics. So the idea is like when you're debugging a trace to issue um, a, a curl or like to like, simulate what happened, towards your microservice, but without like having that count impacting uh, real end user requests. So this is a way that you can achieve uh, this type of debugging. Just by um, you know, having like a header of, of yours, like put there when your request is being issued, and use that for debugging even further. So how does this work? Because this one is like attaching to the current span in the, from the to the current context and adding some information that's relevant for your debugging. So how does this work? I'm going to my readme. Take the curl. What this one will do is they're going to add the header trace with the header with the trace debug ID. Will reach my microservice on my activity type. Let's say busy work. Um, it will get a response. Um, and let me just go again like this. If I'm going here to Jagger, go back, go to activity, which was the problem, to activity type, and say the find traces. But why? Ah, I know why. I have to give it a little time. One moment. Uh, where is activity? Let me just, one sec. Why aren't you working? Huh. Hope I didn't change something last, last night. 
Come on, you should work. It's a TV sandbox, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Just one moment. Let me try with Hobby because it has the same trace filter applied. Uh, um, but it's not, it's going to generate a request and I don't like it. Okay, Hobby all. Uh, activity all. Find traces. Metrics, metrics, send request. Why are you looking so weird? Sorry. Uh, why is my filter? <laughs> activity, activity, hobby. <sighs> one, just one more try. Should have worked. Huh. I'll let me try it like this. Okay, three spans, activity. Okay, so the activity ignite should it did work. What happened is that with that, I added my trace debug ID. But this one is not going to be counted against my requests here. Hope nobody, you know, yes. So this is not counted against my request. So I can debug the so-called backend of activity without impacting what the end user is seeing by just using this type of, uh, of header. And furthermore, just to summarize it, uh, you can provide this custom implementation, but you can do even more. So not just the filter works. There's something else that you should do. So in this case, the reason why I waited a little bit for things to happen it was because I set the processor for the collector to work on batch mode. So this means that I had to like wait for some time for the collector to get the spans, to process the batch of spans, and then get everything. And also the span metrics um, is the processor that does the export of the spans towards Prometheus. So that's the, the other catch, the connection towards Prometheus. And of course, the last one, to curl the other trace debug ID. By the way, you can like rename the property because it's configurable. So if you don't like the trace debug ID name, you can name it however you would like it. The idea is like to have something that can help you into, um, you know, um, and conspicuously debug some debug your system, but without generating more uh, requests that can like be seen by the end user. But there are other ways to work with uh, with tracing. So. More than this, you can have like sampling strategies per your application profile. So you can have, like you have a tool like Jagger for tracing, you can have different service strategies. And here you can like go even further and have service strategies per endpoint, not just necessarily per your uh, microservice. And I kept it really simple here for the microservice part, but um, you can even go even further to the endpoint and have some, uh, some things done there. Now, the probabilistic way of uh, collecting, collecting uh, spans um, is saying, like in this case, that eight out of 10 spans will be collected. That's a probability. Um, another strategy that works really well with the batch um, is um, the rate limiting one. And in this case, for the rate limiting strategy, you have five spans collected per second. Uh, for the hobby, so they use different sampling strategies. And for the others, if you have others in your system, uh, other microservices in your system, you can also use default strategies. Um, and for this one, I just kept it simple to constant, and constant to one means everything will be collected. Um, another thing that I would like to tell you is like, if you wanna collect everything, use the constant, but you should do that maybe in dev, when your application is deployed in dev, or in environments that are not, uh, you know, uh, customer intensive because collecting everything again it will get you into a storage uh, problem. So this sampling strategy also work, works great with batch. But if you would like to use the simple strategy, the simple span processor, you can also use something called tail-based sampling. 
So don't combine them, by the way, batch with tail by sampling because you will end up with confused way of collecting those traces. And in case of the tail based sampling, you have different policies when you can collect uh, your, uh, your spans. So these policies, you can have like, sample ba uh, like uh, samples being collected based on the duration of the trace. In case of Jaeger and its strategies, most of those were quantitative. So it was like probabilistic rate limiting, so with quantity of, of spans. In case of the uh, tail based sampling that is at the level of the uh, open telemetric collector, you can have this quantitatively done. So um, based on duration of the trace or based on the status code of errors captured in the traces. Now this is very important because, for example, you would like to catch all the errors, right? So you can establish such a policy where all the errors are being caught. And to give you an example, uh, you're looking here, now in this one, Go back. Okay, hobby. So, in case of the errors, it's pretty easy to like catch them all because um, they have errors set to true. So, whenever those that status is being encountered, that will be sampled. It's not maybe it's not relevant to like have the trace of very happy um, you know requests and. The more complex policies like to have it composite. Com combine both the sampling strategies of um, the one for latency based uh, with status code one and have composite sampling policy. Um, and you can order the order to be had and there's um, um, a regulation per policy done for that one. Now this is a little bit more complex. I would recommend to start with the other two and then go to with the, uh, with the more complex one and the composite one. Um, besides this, just to summarize, the ways to avoid oversampling is like the first one that I demonstrated to you, like to initiate debug requests using a special HTTP header. Um, then you can try to define different sampling strategies uh, per application profile at the level of your tool, like I, like I showed you with, with Jagger. And by the way, in the, code, uh, in the code repository, you'll find the strategies again defined there and, defined there, and you can set up with a simple script. Um, and afterwards, if you don't like this kind of uh, sampling strategy, depending on the tool, you can like rely solely on your open telemetry collector and have the tail-based sampling uh, processor done there. Um, because in that, uh, that kind of uh, sampling would make the call uh, at the end of the request execution and, uh, well, you will avoid oversampling by doing that. Um, this is where you find the code, actually, uh, and you can try it out. Uh, if you're looking for a place to try out the code uh, after you are done scanning this, I can show you a place where you can try it because I tailored everything to work there. Like, not to, for you to require a lot of processing in terms of Kubernetes to set this up. And if you don't like Kubernetes and you would like to go with Docker Compose, you can find also Docker Compose in, uh, configuration in my repo. So it's not, uh, not just Kubernetes based. Um, okay. Let me, when I see the phones down, I'll move a little bit. So where you can um, deploy, um, um, what's written on my t-shirt? <laughs> on dn.dev slash airhd minus sandbox, so in Red Hat Developer Sandbox. Uh, this is where you can deploy the stuff uh, on this URL here. Uh, you get free access to it, so it's free access, renewable every 30 days. Uh, you can export your setup from there. It's actually set up for developers to work. It's a very friendly environment. It's not something uh, that requires, by the way, you don't need to put any credit card, it's for free, you just need to like create an account with your personal account and that's it. It's, uh, it's yours. Um, so, just to show you the developer sandbox, that one that I used, where to go, uh, developers.redhat.com. Um, clicking on developer sandbox, if the internet is really fast. And here is going to be a red button that says launch your developer sandbox for Red Hat OpenShift. Once you have an, an account created, um, this one, um, 
it will take you directly to your, um, to your sandbox. It will appear again, start using your sandbox, and you'll be able to start using your sandbox. The entire, I think the entire situation like, depends on how fast you're typing your information for creating a Red Hat developer account. I think for me it took me a, a top five minutes, um, and uh, it was done. So, and for the deployment that you see here, if you want to replicate it in the sandbox, all the stuff, all the good stuff are in the repo that you just scanned, and it's in the folder called Kubernetes. There's a script called setupall.ch. So this one has all the show to you, and also has, um, so it has the configurations for Jagger, for um, the collector, for Prometheus. Um, and all the other tweaks that I showed you with the strategy and all this are stored in config maps. Now, don't try this in, uh, these configurations in production. They are tailored only to work in development environments that do not have many resources. For production, you should have different setups for storing traces and um, for like storing the Prometheus information and, and everything else. So you can like try this all there. And, um, and it works and you get the same, same information, everything collected and all, all this and uh, connected over there. Uh, also, if you don't want to build your own Docker uh, versions of my microservices, there's, there one, there's one available that you can easily use and just deploy the information with what I had here, the one that I used also in my deployment. Um, I think that was it from my side. Um, so there are some additional resources. So far, in terms of working with open telemetry, there's a very nice website where you can look into about the specification and the SDK and all. Um, and there are some examples available too, besides my examples. Uh, but if you want to learn how those work with Quarkus, uh, well, you can always look on Quarkus.io and you can get in touch with the Quarkus team on ZulipChat. Um, and if you're looking into more information about modernizing you can read this lovely book written by my colleagues, Marcus Isel and Natale Vinto. Um, and of course, do not forget about the Quarkus cheat sheet where you can like find information on how you can like tweak Quarkus um, that probably are not available in, in the guides. Uh, that was it from my side. Um, now, if you have any questions, I am welcoming them. So, thank you. Questions? Yes? Yeah. Uh, like how the protocol? Oh, yeah. Yes, of course. <laughs> so the question was, uh, what if we don't have uh, HTTP as a protocol? Uh, and we have an event-driven architecture. I think assume that you want protocol to be used, not yeah, HTTP, gRPC, or what? Thank you. So we have Kafka in between, and we have um, we send the events to Kafka, and there are multiple consumers who are actually taking the request forward to process it. Um, so the communication between two services is not synchronous at all. And let's say service A failed in between. Uh, is there anything from open telemetry uh, which also handles this, maybe? Uh, that's an interesting question. I didn't look into Kafka, but I'll, I'll look into that. So I didn't think about it, to no be problem. honest. Thank you. Uh, but if... Okay, um, it's it, based on a schema, so you are changing the schema to communicate? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> 
Any other question? Yes? Uh, congratulations for the talk, really good. It's about uh, this uh, open telemetry collector. Yes. Where exactly is it running? Is it like in a sidecar container along with the application? Um, so I pretty m it's uh, I deployed it uh, using a Docker image. So there is um, a collector image that you can uh, can deploy. So that's how I I've, I've run it with it. It's a different service then. There is. Console. Yeah, it's more like a as I said, it's a proxy. So it's a deployment that acts as a proxy towards the others. The magic, I would say, the configuration magic, it happens on the config map. So the config map that is attached to this collector, to this deployment, contains the information to where to go to the exporters and to the, um, and to the processor. So it, that's what the config map does, all that information that I was, I was telling about there. So if I like, let me just do, 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 telemetry collector, config map, okay. So this is the actually configuration. It's YAML based, it has the receivers and in Jaeger uh, endpoints and the span metrics and everything configured here on, on this one. So that's how, how it works, pretty much with the receivers, processors, pipelines, and all this. Um, so the configuration itself is stored in config map, but the actual running thing that uses this configuration is a regular deployment with a Docker image inside it, regular okay. Kubernetes deployment with a Docker image. Okay, cool. I, is it required that I have Kubernetes or? Uh, no, as I said, uh, you can just, also run it Docker. on Docker Comp awesome. Compose. Uh, it's a Docker image that you can use uh -huh. in other ways as well. Um, I used Kubernetes because I'm used to it, and I thought that since the sandbox is available for free, you can just run and try things there. Then, but there's also Docker Compose, which you can use in the repo, so you can try with that one as well. Cool. It's cool. not cool. mandatory Thanks. to have Kubernetes. Yeah. Actually, the idea of the open telemetry specification is not to make things mandatory necessarily to have some provider or something. But you need to think like, I need to run it somewhere. <laughs> so in my case, it was like either Docker Compose or with, uh, with Kubernetes. In your case, which provider are you using? Is uh, it Jagger? I mean, no, yes, I'm using uh, the receiver for is Jagger. Um, and um, the exporter is uh, on Prometheus. So where I'm receiving the traces is in Jagger, um, and I tell that I tell Jagger to process that uh, data in batch, and use those pan metrics and forward those also to Prometheus. And this is why I have this definition here. So if you see processors span metrics, and then you see metrics span metrics. Take, uh, get them from the receiver, which is OTLP span metric, uh, towards the Prometheus one installation. So that's how things are a bit connected. I know it's a little complicated because it's proxy. Um, it took me a while to understand it as well, like how this, how, how the magic is, is going on between the proxies. But by the way, you'll find multiple configurations of, of the collector. Um, with different receivers and exporters. So yeah, it depends on, on the tools because actually the tools have to be capable to understand what the collector is, uh, is proxying. And that's, I think the collector was the best idea to be found, like to bridge uh, the different specifications that the tools adhered to. Because as I said in the beginning, Jagger adhered with open to open tracing and if you like had something that adhered to open census and you would have wanted to use that one, in the past it would have been a little more, more difficult. But thanks to the collector, you have a bridge now. And also for the folks that are interested in like um, migrating from open tracing to open telemetry, for example, um, there is a compatibility between what was like span definition because if you're going to look into the APIs, the Java APIs of the spans, you'll see that in open tracing, the spans have certain attributes, certain fields, let's say, 
Um, and with open uh, telemetry, they have a slightly different change. Um, and for, if you want to have a compatibility and for those to work together, there's something that's called SHIM, open tel um, and there's, these SHIMs uh, resources can be a bridge between the old, let's say, previous old way of working to the new one. So folks really thought of like how people will migrate to this new uh, spec of stuff um, too. I think a lot of information. We need to catch up with all of this. Yeah, it's, it's, Thank you. it's it, was, it was a bit advanced topic, I know. <laughs> so. Thanks. Another question regarding the distributed nature of the traces. How, if every service has their own sampling, how, how you can ensure, like for example, in a chain of A, B, and C, the traces that A decide to publish contain also kind of the flow of B and C? Uh, well, you're propagating the context. So you're, um, by default, that's why I said like use the default. By default, you will have that uh, uh, between them. Um, I mean, the, con the context enriched with more spans will be uh, available between them. So it's not uh, something that you need to necessarily influence. In my case, you saw the dependency between activity and uh, between hobby and activity because those were the ones deployed and watched over by my um, by my Jagger. But if I'm looking back here. Well, I think last call to app API activity was to the external API. So this is done to the board API call, uh, and this is the last call that you can see there. So you get an information even when you're calling externally uh, something. So it's, you get the, also the information from that. Of course, it's less because it's not managed by you, but it's not something that you necessarily need to force. If it's under your control, like you are deploying it and um, you are um, observing those informations with Jagger, uh, then you can, um, you can easily see the traces and everything. So it's just, if you're configuring uh, correctly the exporters, like where to export the information, there should be no, uh, no other requirement to my, to my knowledge, yeah. I mean, Thank I you. added only the extensions, and if you're gonna look into the microservices, I didn't tweak with extra spans uh, my endpoints. I just let them work as they are. Um, cool. So, for example, the, if you have constant one on service yeah. A, that will also force B and C to publish everything, regardless um, their own sampling. Not necessarily. So, it will force those if both of those use the default strategy. So, if you don't have not defined any other strategy for the other microservices, it, they will use the default one that can be const in, in this example. So if I would have added uh, one more microservice, but it's not comprised into the sampling strategy of Jaeger, that would be going to default. Um, so that's how, how they work. And you can combine all these strategies. So in the example, you'll see that I'm actually combining the three of those uh, all together uh, just for the, to look at the differences between them and what is the impact. Good. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, I think we're done. We're done. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Uh, enjoy the next talk. <laughs>